Good afternoon, and welcome to a discussion that is long overdue. I'm Michelle Williams, Dean of the Faculty here at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and welcome again. Public health in the United States is under siege. More than 500 state and local public health officials have left their jobs since the pandemic began. More than 30 states have enacted laws limiting the power of government agencies to protect, promote, and preserve population health and well being. Despite an influx of COVID relief funding, departments around the nation are in dire financial straits, unable to fund basic functions such as testing, treating, and halting the spread of common, commonly recognized sexually transmitted diseases. And most disturbingly, public health workers around the country are coping with a barrage of harassment, even death threats for simply doing their jobs. A recent New York Times article concluded that local public health agencies across the US are less equipped to confront a pandemic now than they were in early 2020. Imagine less equipped now. It's staggering really. It's also truly alarming because public health is not an abstract concept. Public health is your health. Public health is my health. Public health is the health of our families, our friends, and our colleagues. So this is truly a crisis. And the roots of this crisis are not exclusively partisan by any means. But it is also true that some of the most ferocious and unfortunately most successful attacks on the principles of public health in this pandemic have come from Republican politicians who elevate individual freedom above the collective good. It is in this context that we've invited Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who served as FDA commissioner under President Trump to make the conservative case for investment in public health. Dr. Gottlieb is a physician, a longtime investor in and advisor to biopharma companies, and the author of Uncontrolled Spread, a best-selling book on the COVID-19 pandemic. The book does an excellent job telling the inside story of the federal effort to mobilize against the coronavirus. But I found myself most drawn to Dr. Gottlieb's prescription for beating the next pandemic. He shows us that a well-resourced, thoughtfully designed and fully empowered public health system is critical, absolutely critical to pandemic preparedness. It is clear to me that we must start now to build the system that he describes, but we can't do it without the support of those conservatives who have spent much of this pandemic denigrating public health and damaging public health institutions. We need strong voices making the conservative case for investments in public health. And that's exactly what today's event is about. I'm delighted to turn the podium over to Meg Terrell, senior health and science reporter for CNBC. Since the earliest days of this pandemic, Meg has been one of the most authoritative voices on the COVID beat. She has interviewed Scott dozens of times, and we're so glad and so honored that she has chosen to be here again with us today, moderating this fireside chat. Meg, I want to thank you again, and I want to turn the podium now over to you and to Scott. Thanks, Meg. Well, thank you so much, Dean Williams. I'm super happy to get to be here talking with Dr. Gottlieb. Thank you to all the viewers who are joining us out there. And we'd love to have your questions for Scott. So um, please submit them by emailing the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. So Scott, of course, we are here to talk about the conservative case for investing in public health, but I have to just ask you to start out with your thoughts on Omicron, where we stand right now. There's new information coming out really by the minute, but we're still all grasping for real data. Um, how bad do you think this is at this point? Yeah, I think it's really hard to tell, Megan. Thanks for, for having me here today. There's new data that just came out from uh, South African health officials. They um, dropped uh, additional sequencing data. So the number of sequences now is 250 up from about 80-something uh, last week. 
Um, they also put out data on testing over the course of the last week, as well as cases um, broken down by region, by demographics all across Africa. And so, you know, it's consistent with what we've been seeing, which is rising cases across the country, increasing testing against that backdrop. But the data is very hard to interpret. And I think that some of the analysis that's being done um, right now may be uh, potentially overstating the impact um, of this new variant because of some of the assumptions that are being make, made. So for example, if you look at some of the assessments of what the transmissibility of the potential transmissibility of this, um, this new variant is, some of those assumptions that are getting picked up pretty widely um, are based on uh, prevalence estimates that, that's derived from the sequencing data. So 100% of all the samples that were sequenced were this new variant. But my understanding is that they're biasing um, what they're sequencing for samples that show S gene target failure so that they show that the S gene can't be detected on PCR, which is very likely to be this variant because it's, the S gene so heavily mutated, PCR isn't detecting this variant. So they're selecting four samples that are likely to be um, the new variant and sequencing those. And so it stands to reason that a very high percentage, if not 100%, and it's not quite 100%, but it's a very high percent, would in fact be this new variant. So it doesn't appear to be um, a randomly derived sample of um, patient samples that they're sequencing. So you can't, you can't draw a prevalence estimate from that. Now, if you assume that, that there has been a you know, very big spike in cases over the last uh, month or three weeks, just when this new variant emerged and, and that this new variant accounts for those cases because Delta had mostly subsided, then you could surmise that most of what you're going to see is this new variant. But I don't think you could draw that conclusion because if you look at the time period just before um, we discovered this new sequence, you saw, a, you saw Delta starting to increase in prevalence on, on their sequencing data, as well as another variant that's been circulating in South Africa for some period of time. It never really broke out, C12. It's sort of, it's waxed and waned over the course of the last year at various times it's increased in prevalence, but you saw it increasing in prevalence in some of the provinces. And so I'm not saying that this is another Delta wave, but it's possible that as Delta subsided and they relaxed mitigation, you did see a spike up in Delta like we saw in the UK. And that's part of what's going on in the background here. And so it's partly accounting for the rise in cases and the you know small tick up in hospitalizations, but we're assuming that all of what we're observing is um, is a new variant. And so if you kind of, if, if it's not, if the, the new variant doesn't account for everything we're observing, um, the sort of analysis changes dramatically. Um, if you, you know, if you just sort of assume that this new variant has been around for a longer period of time, the analysis changes dramatically. And Trevor Bedford, who's one of the best genetic epidemiologists, put out a new analysis just now on Twitter about 30 minutes ago, where he now is based on the genetic diversity that he's observing in the sequences, He's now saying that this first made its first entry into human circulation in late September before they were saying um, October and then they had said early November, which was very concerning because that would mean it's exploding in prevalence. Now they're pushing it back to late September because as they get more sequences, especially in other countries, they're observing more genetic diversity and dating this back further. So. I think we're, you know, we have sort of imperfect information right now. Um, it could be confounded by the fact that we are not getting a true um, estimate of prevalence. And it could be confounded by the fact that the early sequences that we're looking at are biased because they oversampled an initial cluster. We know they did that. Um, they, they, they drew a lot of samples inside a university. I think they started swabbing students and finding asymptomatic cases of this new variant and sequenced a lot of that. And so you, you, have, a, you have a biased uh, data set because you've oversampled um, a single cluster. So it might be underestimating the true genetic diversity of this. So it's a long way of saying, we don't know. We're gonna know more probably within two or three weeks. It's frustrating that we're kind of back where we were in February of you know, 2020, where it's sort of the fog of viral war and we're not able to get to the bottom of this with all the tools we have. I don't think we're probably doing enough to support um, the public health researchers in South Africa and certainly the travel ban, I think exacerbated the challenges that they face in trying to track down this, um, all this information and put out this analysis to, you know, for, the benefit, for the benefit of the world. Um, so I'll pause there. <laughs> I'm sure there's follow-up questions, Meg. Well, I'll just ask you one more about this and then I'll get to the main topic of our discussion because we have a ton of questions from folks already. But are you surprised we haven't found Omicron here in the United States? Do you think this is a failure of our surveillance systems or could it possibly really not be here? No, Omicron is 
absolutely here. We're going to um, turn over a case. I would would be surprised if we didn't have a case that we turned over this week, given the fact that they're going back and you know looking for estrogen target failure now and resequencing those samples when they find them, um, and now looking at you know travel related um, infections. I think that it, it's not spreading at any. Um, measurable level because we would detect that we're doing a hundred thousand sequences a week. I think this is sort of one of the untold um, really um, triumphs of, of the pandemic is how we've been able to scale the, the surveillance system in this country. Uh, we're sequencing 20% of all reported samples right now. So we would be detecting this if there was any community transmission of this, but there's certainly sporadic cases of this. Um, and that doesn't mean it's not spreading at a low level. I mean, we don't, we also don't understand the clinical characteristics of this. Um, you know, there's some speculation that maybe this is causing less severe disease. So maybe the um, more of the presentation is subclinical. That's very speculative. It's sort of anecdotal. Um, but that could be one potential explanation for why this kind of suddenly burst onto the scene, right? So there's a couple of theories about, about the, the lineage of this. If you look at the, can I, can I take five more minutes or is this too much? How about one? All right. If you, if, you, if you look at the lineage of this, it's traced all the way back to 2020, but then the trail goes cold and then all of a sudden this mutated strain breaks out sometime in August or September. Um, and so the one theory is that it was in an animal reservoir mutating. Another theory is that, that it was in a chronically infected patient mutating. A third theory could be that this was actually spreading at a low prevalence. It's not that contagious. We're overestimating um, its transmissibility and it causes milder symptoms. So it was less likely to present because the South African CDC isn't doing a lot of sequencing. Um, they're only sequencing, I think, 8,000 samples a month. And so you could absolutely have something that's spreading at a low level that would go undetected. So that's another possibility. And that would speak to the fact that this could potentially cause less serious illness. We don't know that, but it, it has to be on the table. Hmm. Okay. Tons of questions about Omicron. This is really fascinating though. And it's a different way of looking at things aside from just all of the alarm we hear about the number of mutations and the fact that it could evade the vaccine protections. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that for a while. Hmm. that's just it. I mean, that you, you hit, you hit it right there because I think what's happening is people are looking at the sequence. It looks very scary. And in there, they're taking the data and fitting it to their perception of the sequence. Um, mm. we've, we've made the mistake of doing that before. I think the place where we made that mistake is in the whole debate about origin and was this a lab leak or did it come from nature? I think people looked at the sequence, drew a conclusion based on the sequence and the fact that the sequence didn't look like anything that couldn't derive from nature. And then kind of ignored all the other circumstantial evidence that started to emerge that, that pointed in the direction that this could have come out of a lab. So I think we've made the mistake of multiple points in this pandemic of over-interpreting sequence data and then trying to fit the sort of observed clinical data to match our presumptions about the sequence rather than the other mm -hmm. way around. Hmm. Uh, so going back to the Dean's introduction, um, she mentioned a number of public health departments that are in worse uh, states of preparation for the pandemic than they were even at the beginning. Um, and the number of uh, states that um, have banned mask mandates or vaccine mandates. Um, what is your interpretation of just the divide in this country and the impact that's had on the pandemic? And did it have to be this way? Was it going to be this way from the beginning? Um, how did we get here? No, I mean, I, it certainly didn't have to be this way. And this is where political leadership becomes important. Um, you know, I think, it, you know, in the prior administration, a lot of this, you, you saw um, a, a lot of demagoguing of some of the public health measures uh, and, and a lack of leadership around galvanizing the public behind sort of a consistent set of practices that could help control the spread. And instead, those practices were called into question. I mean, things as simple as mask wearing um, became a political issue and sort of a you know, expression of people's political virtue. And it was allowed to be that way by people who are in public office. So I don't think that these things needed to be as overtly political as they became. I think, you know, political leaders let that happen and in some cases instigated it. I do think that the issues around the skepticism of public health more broadly is going to be far more profound because any, um, any analysis of how we prepare better for the next pandemic uh, and improve public health more generally, but certainly improve our pandemic preparedness has to be predicated on an assumption that we're going to have to strengthen public health authorities and empower them uh, differently. And I think that there's going to be broad skepticism of doing that. And it's not just, you know, this isn't just conservatives, although it's going to be 
um, it's going to break down more among conservatives. I think it's a broader section of the public that have become skeptical of public health agencies and, and the guidance that they issued because there was a perception that it wasn't always well informed, that it changed a lot, um, that the, the full truth wasn't being told to the public. And, and that's certainly taken a home on the political right, but it's not just confined to, to the political right. And so this is going to be a big challenge. And it may be one of the reasons we haven't seen Congress really take up the issue of pandemic preparedness for the future is that you have no consensus in Congress right now. I don't think you can get a bill through that would give the CDC new authorities and resources. I, I think, first of all, you wouldn't get Republican support, but I think you'd have a, um, a difficult problem in the political middle as well around getting support for that kind of a measure. And that may be one, one of the reasons we really haven't seen that go forward. So I think this is gonna be the big challenge um, You know, after we get through this pandemic is the, the broad skepticism of public health agencies, public health authorities, public health guidance um, that's gonna persist. And it's gonna obviously be um, more pronounced, certainly on the political right, because it's found a home there. But I think it's going to be a little bit more pervasive than that, too. So what is the case that you make, uh, the conservative case, as this whole session is called, for investing in public health? What would what would your argument to those folks be? Yeah, well, first of all, I think from, a, from the standpoint of, you know, my former perch at FDA, I think that there is a strong case to be made that if you have well-functioning public health agencies, um, that are properly empowered, it actually could help unlock innovation because clearly we have a regulatory structure where, you know, certain opportunities, public health opportunities, technologies, obviously this is most manifest with, you know, new medical technologies. They don't, they can't advance unless they can run a gauntlet through a regulatory process and a reimbursement process. And if that regulatory reimbursement process is dysfunctional, opaque, um, ultimately, it stymies innovation and entrepreneurship. And so I think the fact that FDA is a well-functioning agency that has a predictable process where the um, you know, guidelines by which new technologies are going to be judged is clearly understood actually helps promote innovation, um, as opposed to if you had an agency that was opaque and you know, perceived as dysfunctional and um, arbitrary, I think that that would increase the cost of capital and actually discourage innovation and investment that would lead to new medical um, innovations. And so that, that's one of the things that I, I think is an important point. Sometimes, um, you know, sometimes if you over-resource a regulatory agency, they spend, they, they have too much time and they spend a lot of time doing things that are counterproductive, perhaps. That's the old narrative. But sometimes when you properly resource a regulatory agency, you actually get, um, get pretty good bang for your buck. You get a well-functioning agency that's able to, uh, you know, create fair, fair and clear rules of the road. The other is that, you know, we ha I think we have to look at national uh, public health through the lens of national security. And I think that this, this pandemic really makes that clear. Um, looking at how this pandemic impacted all of our other national priorities, it changed the course of world history. Um, we lost geopolitical advantage against our adversaries. Would China have moved into Hong Kong? If the world wasn't distracted by COVID, would China be threatening Taiwan in the way it is if the world hadn't been distracted by this? I don't think so. Things changed around the globe that put the U.S. in an adverse position because we were so um, so hit by this, this pandemic. And I think what the pandemic showed is that respiratory pathogens in particular, but, but certainly pandemic strains, pose an asymmetric risk to the to the West and to democracies. We proved uniquely incapable of implementing respiratory precautions and taking the other measures that would have protected ourselves. And so I think we need to look at public health preparedness through a lens of national security. And when you do that, you start to think about making investments very differently. And, and then the final point I'd make is more around the individual. I think people can't have dignity and reach their aspirations without the tools of public health. Disease, you know, disease is debilitating. Infectious disease holds people back. It holds back human interactions. I mean, look, look at us today. You know, we would normally be in a studio somewhere, all of us, or we'd be in a conference room. We can't do that. And so um, it, 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 it keeps people from, you know, reaching their goals. If, if you're um, aspirational and you want people to be free to pursue um, their given destiny, you want them to be unencumbered by things like disease. You want them to be unencumbered by rules or practices that are preventing them from assembling and coming together. It's hard to have sort of an aspirational view for the exercise of human freedom and, and an aspirational view for the exercise of human dignity as a backdrop of disease and the impairment that it causes and all those things. And so I think, you know, if you're a conservative and you believe in, you know, people being sort of free and empowered to reach their, their chosen goals, 
Um, the only way they're going to be able to do that is if they have the ability to interact, to move freely, uh, to be unencumbered by disease that could hold them back. And so all the tools of public health become very important for creating an environment where they can, they can live that way. So that's a very sort of conservative notion. I don't think conservatives, a lot of my colleagues are looking at through, looking at public health through that lens that you really need tools of public health to have human dignity. It, that all sounds extremely rational, but just how how is it possible to to win people over to this side when it's so politically advantageous for people like Rand Paul to attack Dr. Fauci every time they're together in a test, you know, a hearing? Um, when it, people are so dug in and it's advantageous to be dug in, how do you change perspectives and, and approaches? Yeah, what, what I worry more about is where um, people are sort of um, mistaking um, kind of public health guidance that is efforts that we want to do collectively to try to promote the collective good for intrusions in people's personal liberty. Like the idea that, you know, telling people to wear mask is, masks in, in confined spaces or on airplanes is, is impacting their right to choose how they're going to live or um, implementing, you know, vaccine mandates, which we've had for ages and ages, uh, is somehow, you know, sort of forced, uh, a forced measure on people. If we, if we can't get consensus around the easy stuff like that, or the stuff that we've long accepted, that's where I really um, start to worry about the future. And, and most of this is happening at a state level. I mean, most of this is being promoted by governors. And look, I think, I think the political left has made mistakes too by kind of stumbling into this. Um, I think that there are things that could have been done differently that would have um, not made these sort of political fault lines as clear. And I think that there were probably times that certain people on the political left kind of wanted the, wanted that, that very clear debate, wanted this to be a political debate. So I don't think that the two sides are blameless here. I don't think this is only the conservatives, but, um, but I, obviously it's mostly coming from the, the opposition to public health measures more generally that are, I think, counterproductive to what we need to achieve in trying to get past this pandemic is are being, you know, erected on the political right and maybe instigated a little bit on the political left. And the place where I, you know, I, I had the most misgivings was around the, the vaccine mandates. Like I thought it was appropriate for the Biden administration to implement a mandate around the military, around healthcare providers through Medicare, where they clearly have um, authorities. Um, certainly the federal workforce, I mean, it's an issue of federal readiness. They work for the president. But I think that implementing a mandate down to you know, what, what are essentially small businesses was a bridge too far and was going to create, um, you know, it was, it was inevitable it was going to create the political backlash that it did and you were going to have litigation and it was going to be fought out in state houses. And my worry is now that you've sort of created those political fault lines people going forward aren't going to hear that this was a fight over a COVID mandate. They're going to hear that this was a fight over a vaccine mandate, and they're going to start to oppose mandates, vaccine mandates more broadly, and things that we've long come to accept, like mandates around childhood vaccination, now are going to be pulled in, because I don't think most people are going to be following this closely enough, and maybe they'll lack the sophistication to nuance this and say, oh, this was about the COVID mandate, but everything else we've come to accept. And what they're going to say is, the government shouldn't be telling us to do anything when it comes to vaccines. And there's going to be a sizable portion of the population now that takes that message away because they've been told to by, by the people who are fighting this on the political right. That's mm -hmm. the, those are the kinds of things I worry about the most. And a lot of it's happening at a state level. Well, it seems like a lot of the issues at the beginning um, that you were talking about um, came through messaging that just didn't come across the right way. You know, you joined us on our stat podcast a couple uh, months ago where we initially talked about this topic and you, you just mentioned this sort of the way that things were communicated around masks. There was sort of ambivalence there at the beginning. And we've got a great question from uh, Tamara or Tamara in the audience who asks, how can public health leaders make clear recommendations while also being frank with the public about scientific unknowns? How can they gain public trust and recover it when inevitably some of their predictions turn out to be wrong? Is there a better way to have been doing this <laughs> since the beginning? Well, look, I think that there, there were clearly junctures, and you, you're referencing what we talked about in this, in this discussion on stat, there were clearly junctures where we, um, I think public health officials, even, even setting aside sort of the fog of viral war and the fact that we lacked imperfect information, I don't think we're putting out recommendations that were um, sort of bottom line. They were based on other considerations and not all those considerations were being transparently communicated. Mass is the most obvious one. 
um, where there was a concern around making a mass recommendation because of the impact it would have on supply um, and also the impact it would have on people's willingness to comply with other mitigation. There was a presumption early on, and I was part of these discussions with the Trump administration because I was pushing them to go forward with the mask recommendation. There was a worry that if you told people that they should wear masks if they go out, that it would encourage people to go out at a time when you were telling them to stay home. And so it would be sort of a conflicting message and it would confuse the public. But that, you know, that wasn't made clear to the public why, why they were um, recommending that people not, not wear masks at that time. And I think that that's the problem because eventually that's gonna catch up with you if you're not fully transparent about the basis for your you know, decision-making and your recommendations, um, eventually that's gonna be revealed. And, and that, that eroded trust and it eroded trust broadly. And there were multiple episodes like that. The masks is the easiest to explain and the most obvious. So you know, how could you communicate better? I think you could communicate better by, by being more transparent, explaining things more clearly to the public about what the basis is of decisions and concerns. I mean, even in the context of this current variant, we're not doing a really good job of explaining what we know and don't know. I don't think public health officials have done that. We haven't taken the time to do that. And it wouldn't be, I think the public could kind of assimilate um, the uncertainty, uh, but it, it really hasn't been articulated well. Hmm. So let's talk about your book a little bit. It's behind you there. Everybody can see uncontrolled spread. <laughs> you Good product placement. What's that? Good product placement. Yes. You really take aim at the CDC um, in the book. Um, and I'm wondering your thoughts on on the right way to to either position that agency to do uh, better in your eyes in terms of you know pandemic preparedness or even responding to the current pandemic that we're in, or do you need a different agency, perhaps in the national security framework you were talking about to to be tackling pandemics? You've often criticized CDC as being a very academic uh, agency that publishes wonderful papers months after an event has happened. Um, what do you think is the right approach there? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be hard to sort of fundamentally change the way the CDC operates because it's it's ingrained in the organization. It's very cultural. cultural. It's driven by the culture of the organization. It's a very insular organization, high science, um, exquisite retrospective analyses. Only trust their, They only trust their data. Uh, they don't like other people drawing conclusions until they've drawn a conclusion first. You know, I had the I had challenges with CDC when I was at FDA around um, influenza, around outbreaks of foodborne illness, where they wouldn't want us to go forward with certain public health warnings that we wanted to make because they hadn't reached their conclusion yet and felt that they they had to make a, a decision before we ultimately were able to opine on things that I felt were very important for the public to know. And this was most obvious around outbreaks of foodborne illness, where CDC has a role in if you have a cluster of infections in this country anywhere. Um, CDC goes in and determines where the infections are coming from, and they'll make a determination that there's a food source for the infections, and then they'll hand it off to FDA, and FDA does the investigation to trace it back to a particular food source, and then FDA will say it's from, you know, Jack in the Box. Don't mean to objectify Jack in the Box. Um, so, but very often when you have an outbreak of a cluster of illnesses, it's very clear that there's a food source, and it's very clear what the food source is going to be. So I always wanted to go out and warn early before we had finished making even our determination at FDA because I felt it was important for the public to know that we are suspicious that there's an outbreak that's associated with this food product. I got a lot of resistance from CDC. I mean, this ended up being a, a real sort of debate within the secretary's office and got all the way elevated. I just went ahead and did it. If you went back, if you go back to my Twitter feed, which you can't do right now because my predecessor uh, deleted it. But if you went back to my Twitter feed, you would see that I used to say, we are investigating a cluster of illnesses with CDC. We think it's going to be this, but we don't know. Uh, that, those are the kinds of statements I would put out on Twitter. I couldn't put it out on public health communications because it would have to go through, you know, interdepartmental clearance and all that. And I would have been blocked. So I would just tweet it out because I thought it was important to the public. No, so that just gives you an, 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 an it's sort of a one small microcosm of where, you know, CDC is very process driven. They want to finish their analysis, then hand it off to FDA. Um, how do you fix that? I don't think you can. I think I think you can sort of change the culture over time. I think ultimately what you need to do is not create a new agency, but if you want to have a pandemic um, component, a pandemic response um, apparatus, I think you need to create some new vehicle. I think it has to reside within CDC. It's going to have to borrow from the other silos within CDC. It's going to have to coordinate. But I think I think it ultimately needs to be some new organization with a new culture and and the. 
the organization that was created by Mark Lipsitch and Caitlin Rivers, Dylan George, that new pandemic targeting center. Um, I think that could be the seed that becomes a new pandemic preparedness shop within CDC. I, I mean, th those are the right people to be running it. They, I think, have the right mindset and, and you know, they're going to build an organization there that I think has a different culture around public health emergencies than, you know, the mothership of CDC. Hmm. As we're thinking about the importance of building these kinds of uh, initiatives, you just pointed out one of the biggest issues is going to be finding the funding to be able to support this kind of thing. Um, that brings me to one of the questions we have um, from Veronique, um, who asks, how will upcoming elections, including 2024, the presidential election, affect our ability to overcome the pandemic and rebuild public health infrastructure? I'm just wondering your thoughts. I mean, answer that, and then I'll go. Yeah, well, my, my biggest fear is that this becomes an election issue. You know, that, that I, I think you're going to see governors run against the, the vaccine mandates um, in, in the next cycle. And the next cycle is obviously, you know, the, inter, the, the midterm elections, mm -hmm. and you're gonna see people in Congress do that. Now, whether or not that bleeds into the presidential election is, is gonna be somewhat dependent upon where are we with COVID? And if, you know, if we've gotten control of this pandemic and fully through it, as I think we will be, I don't think this is going to be as big of an issue at a national level, but it's certainly going to be an issue in the midterm elections. And I think that's going to further solidify the sort of political positions that have been staked out around some of these issues where we should have a broader public consensus. Look, this isn't unique to this country. You're seeing it also in, in Western democracies in Europe as well. But I think it's fairly pronounced in this country and a little bit more pervasive. How do you respond to that as, as a member of the Republican Party, somebody who served in the Trump administration? Do you feel like you're on an island a little bit? I mean, do you have people in the party you feel feel similarly to you? And how do you communicate to people? And what are you communicating to people about trying to fix these problems? Look, I talk a lot to the leadership in, in the House. I was brought in um, a number of times to brief the entire congressional caucus in the House, um, mostly when Liz Cheney was there. Um, and I still, I still talk to a lot of members. Um, I, I think that there, that it's, um, it's become harder, a little bit more difficult for the members who are thoughtful around these issues. And there's a lot of them, most of them are, um, to stake out thoughtful positions publicly because there is sort of a, a component where of the party where this has become, you know, opposition to masks and vaccines and, um, and mitigation and other kinds of mandates has become a galvanizing political issue. So that's, that's where I, I worry that you're gonna have, the, the, the consensus in the party is actually very thoughtful around public health issues. You've got a lot of very thoughtful members in leadership, but it becomes very hard to lead on those positions and stake out um, you know, positions around promoting public health when you've got a, um, a sort of vocal minority that is galvanizing a grassroots movement that's kind of oppositional to this. Um, and that's what's happening, I think. So um, <laughs> do I, is it hard for me to interact? It's not hard for me to interact because for the most part, I haven't felt a lot of criticism from the, the political right. I mean, there's been some members, I know who they are, taking a few shots of me on Twitter, I've seen it. I, you know, and, and so obviously there's other stuff that, you know, you other criticisms you get from, the general public, but um, but for the most part, the leadership, I, I still communicate with them and, and, and a lot of members. And I think they're very thoughtful around public health issues and what we should be doing. I think it's just harder for this to be an issue that you kind of lead on um, because you don't have a consensus within the own, their own party about it. Well, and you are one of these people who manages to sort of appeal to, to people on all sides, I think of the political spectrum. It seems like you have relationships across aisles um, but what kind of pushback have you gotten from the public or from anybody um, on making public health focused statements in the media as you do? Well, I, you know, I, like you probably and others who've been out um, in the media on, on this issue over the last year and a half, um, there's plenty of stuff that I see in social media um, that's highly critical. I think a lot of it is around um, you know, perception that I was supportive of, of some of the mitigation, of a lot of the mitigation, the early steps um, that we took when, when we had, you know, the obviously the very dire situation in New York that I've supported, uh, the, the, the masks, mask mandates that I've supported, certain vaccine mandates um, 
So a lot of it's around that. So I, I see the same criticism that I think other people who've been supportive of some of these public health measures would see. Um, but you know, and, that, and that's from the general public where I you know get get some of that. And I don't I don't get it as much from the political leadership, uh, even those who disagree with me, because I you know I think most people who are in leadership positions are privately pretty thoughtful, even if they have challenges taking out public certain public positions at times. Mm -hmm. um, going to a question from Peter, who asks, "How can we address the mistrust in government and in science, especially in conservative circles?" Yeah, look, this is, I mean, this is the the question, right? Um, I think a lot of the trust has been eroded and it's going to be hard to earn it back. Um, and it's going to take time. Uh, and some of it, some of the mistrust is the result of, uh, of people who've used some of what has gone on over the last year for sort of political gain and, and demagogued um, what were reasonable steps and reasonable measures of public health officials and authorities to be taking. Some of it's, some of the mistrust is because uh, the public health agencies have not done a good job, haven't been transparent, haven't been truthful, haven't been right. I mean, I'm not saying they were in, intentionally untruthful, but they haven't been, um, they haven't been right and haven't been fully transparent at times. So some of it, some of the mistrust, I think is quite frankly earned. You know, how can you, how can you reset things? Um, I think you're going to have to try to change sort of the structure of, of how guidance gets issued and, and these things get done where it feels more that there's a clear process, that things are clearly explained to the public, that it's participatory. You know, just the, looking at CDC guidance, for example, I mean, CDC issues these guidance documents that are convoluted, hard to interpret, come out of an opaque process. They don't, they don't articulate in their own guidance documents how they reach certain conclusions. They've never explained things like, you know, why six feet, why three feet, um, they're not forced to do that. They're not forced to revisit guidance on any clear timetable. There's no public process for adjudicating guidance before they, they issue it. So how do you trust a process like that? You know, if you're a business that has to implement these things or even a consumer that is being asked to conform to them, how do you trust that when it comes out of such an opaque and arbitrary process? And so I think taking a look at how we issue public health recommendations to the public is going to be the starting point. Do you think, are there other countries that have done this better communication about these things? Yeah, I, I don't really have a great handle on what goes on in other countries. I mean, the UK certainly seems to do a better job, you know, with a sort of similar society. I think, you know, the, the, the kind of the political issues that they have to contend with are somewhat similar to ours. And they seem to be doing a better job of um, explaining things in a way that's transparent to the public and galvanizing more public support around it. You know, there are other countries where you, where you have more, um, more willingness to conform to some of the measures that have to be implemented, have different, they're, they're culturally different. I don't think you can make sort of apples to apples comparisons about whether or not it's just a, a function of better governance. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think having different messengers from the public health agencies could help, I mean, to doctor, to to many people, Dr. Fauci is a hero. They've got the bobbleheads. They named their dogs after him. Um, but to many others, they won't listen to him. Do, do we need different messengers? Yeah, I mean, it certainly would be advantageous not to have um, just sort of national figures messaging this stuff, but try to uh, get more of a grassroots effort going where you had local support local implementation, um, you know, maybe with some local adaptation. So it wasn't, didn't feel so top down. I think when, you know, a single sort of federal official becomes the public face of all the, um, the guidance and the recommendations that are coming out, I'm not, you know, talking about Dr. Fauci in particular, we, this always happens in, in moments of crisis. I think in the public health realm in particular, that only creates more temptation for people to try to draw fault lines around these, these things. Be, you know, the more you elevate it, the more the, it potentially is gonna divide the public. The more you localize it, the less divisive it's gonna be. And there was really no effort to localize these, these um, measures that we were taking, part, in part because you know, we were moving quickly and it probably would have been, wouldn't have been expedient to do, but in part because we had no infrastructure for that. I mean, I, if you, CDC can't do that. They have no communications apparatus where they can leverage local leaders. Um, they wouldn't even know, probably know who really to call. So there's no system mm. for doing that. Well, that brings me to a question from Kathleen, um, who notes the U.S. tends to focus on funding short-term initiatives where results can be seen immediately by voters. 
Uh, what will it take to build a long-term commitment to a solid public health infrastructure, both at the local and state and federal levels? She says people understand the need to fund the fire department even when there's no fire burning, but they don't seem to translate that concept to public health. I think this is going to be why it's so important to start thinking about public health through the lens of national security and national preparedness, because I think when you're looking at it through that lens and you, you look at how a public health event was able to erode our national security and change the course of history um, and hurt us geopolitically, you start to make different kinds of investments. You start to look at this in the same way you invest in, you know, uh, the defense of the nation and the military. You know, I'll give you one quick example. Um, we've, we've, created extremely redundant and hardened facilities for the manufacturer of Nupogen and created vendor managed inventory of that drug. Amgen has invested in that. Um, and that's because we wanted to make sure there would never be an interruption in the supply of Nupogen because we recognized that if there, there was ever a dirty bomb attack on a city, a radiological attack, you need a surge supply of Nupogen. So we provided for it by making certain investments in what was ostensibly a public health tool. Uh, if you're thinking about, uh, sort of a, a naturally occurring event through the same lens that you would think about an attack on a nation, a bioterrorism attack or a radiological attack, you'd start to make investments in things like having redundant capacity for this scale up of manufacturing of antibodies or vaccines. You'd start to make different kinds of investments that we just historically haven't made and you'd maintain them. We've, we've done this in the national security realm, when we, but we've done it around threats that were deliberate threats. We've never done it around threats that were naturally occurring threats. So radiological attack or bioterrorism attack. And the reason why what those preparations really weren't transferable to the situation we faced from COVID is that those, those preparations were made for geographically confined attacks. We always thought that there was a smallpox attack or an anthrax attack or a radiological attack it happened in a city. We never thought about a distributed public health calamity um, in the context of our national security preparedness. So our national security preparedness really didn't prepare us for this. Um, we've got a question from James who notes, um, public health often requires centralization of data collection and coordination at a high level, which is at odds with states' rights arguments. Do you agree? And how do you overcome this? Yeah, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I think that the, the states have a very important role to play. We have to empower local public health agencies, and that's really the place to start. And you talk about how to build trust. You build trust at, at a grassroots level. You build trust at the local level. And so instead of empowering a big CDC in, in, in Atlanta, you start to empower local public health departments to, to take on more of the data collection work, to take on more of the work of doing of implementing public health measures at a local level. I think the public health agencies at the state level are going to have a very important role to play if we're going to improve our data collection nationally. I mean, look at, look at the sequencing exercise that's underway in, inside this country. We're now sequencing 100,000 um, samples a week. Uh, it, we're sequencing 20% of all the reported um, positive tests. It's an enormous enterprise. I mean, the scale of it is absolutely enormous. And we've scaled it in like six to eight months. Um, the public health labs are doing 20,000 of those sequences every week. So, you know, by empowering the state public health uh, labs, we've been able to scale this very much more quickly. So I think that's what we're gonna have to look, look to do across the board if we're gonna be collecting better information as part of a pandemic strategy. Mm. Uh, we've got a question from Don in the audience about how can there be public health without addressing inequity and social injustice? Um, how, do you, how do you look at that, that issue as a, through the lens of public health, and then also, what what is does that argument resonate in conservative circles? Well, I, I think I think public health encompasses addressing um, those issues. I mean, we need to obviously it, 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 the COVID made very clear the inequities uh, in the distribution of a lot of things in society, and particular healthcare, um, where you saw communities that were really locked out of opportunities to get access to the vaccine early access to testing. You saw a disproportionate impact of COVID in um, communities that had historically been deprived um, access to quality healthcare. And so we're gonna have to address those inequities in the delivery of routine healthcare if we're gonna make ourselves more resilient to these kinds of threats. Uh, that, that, I think that that's part of the discussion. It's part of the discussion of how we strengthen public health in this country is addressing uh, social inequities and also inequities in, in the delivery of healthcare. 
Hmm. So just thinking back on our conversation, I mean, you sound pretty discouraged in some ways um, about the idea that this could become or will continue to be a wedge issue in upcoming elections. That it'll be diff- difficult to get the parties to come together into funding uh, better pandemic preparedness. Do you ever think about going back into government or running for something? Can you help by doing that? No, I don't think I'm going to run for anything. Look, I, I am discouraged because I think we're at um, we're at a very sort of precarious moment where this is now pub- things that we used to just kind of accept or things that existed in the background have now become part of the political discussion and are now something that elected leaders are using to you know sort of define themselves politically and that is a very dangerous place i think for us to be for as a public health community but also as a country uh because you know if if we see sort of i i'm worried we're going to see declining vaccine uh utilization across the board you're going to see first of all we're seeing huge drops in, va- in flu vaccination this year but there's other ways to explain that but if we start seeing declines in um, people's acceptance of childhood immunizations that's going to be a real challenge for this country. And I'm worried you're going to start to see that because of uh, because everything that's happened, all these political divides have been created around COVID are going to bleed into other aspects of public health delivery. And, um, you know, I think we need to be conscious of that as a public health community. And, and, and that speaks to, you know, just because you can do something where you, maybe even you should do something, do you do you do it? Did, did, do you, did, was the federal mandate a bridge too far as I, I've argued at times? Um, and are there other things we should have shown a little restraint on because you didn't want to step across a line that was going to make this an overtly political discussion, even if even if objectively that was the right thing to do from a public health standpoint, just because you can do it, you, maybe even you should do it. Do you do it because there's going to be an adverse consequence? There's many places where we we make trade offs like that in public policy and even in in, in healthcare and, and regulation at FDA. I mean, there were places that we had to make those kinds of calls, um, and I don't know that we were mindful enough in this context. Hmm. All right. Well, that's about our time, Scott. Thanks for a really fascinating discussion. I think maybe you're you're more worried about the political climate and less worried than most people about Omicron. I don't know if that's the right way to sum that up. I wouldn't say I'm less worried about Omicron. I think that there's a lot of confounding information right now. And we're drawing conclusions from a very imperfect data set. You know, this could the, the sort of confidence interval around this is really wide right now. All right. Uh, Well, thank you so much for a a great conversation. Thank you to everybody for the questions out there. And I'm sorry we could not get to them all. You had so many good ones. Uh, I also, of course, want to thank the Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health for hosting this event. Everybody have a great afternoon.